Hey, good morning, everybody. So glad to see all of you here this morning. Happy New Year. I am just, I'm just fired up about 2021. I think God's got some great things in store for us, and uh, I'm just excited about what God's going to do at East Coast Believers Church. We have an incredible year planned for you, and um, you know, oftentimes you'll hear me say, and what a, it's a great Sunday to do this is go all in for God for one year, like give God your very best, and I promise you, you won't regret it. Well, I get, I, I've done this for a lot of years and get a lot of challenges. Over the year, over, throughout the months, I get a lot of testimonies that are sent to me. I got one sent the other day from a, a couple in the church, and they were in first service. They said, good morning, Pastor. Uh, Merry Christmas to you and your family. I felt compelled to share with you this the incredible year it has been for my family personally. All thanks to God and to the challenge that you set forth. Go all in for Jesus for 12 months. Well, over a little over a year ago, I accepted the challenge. My wife and I went through Grow, started serving on a team, went through another small group. I joined a men's group, made church a priority, and began reading the Bible uh, from front to back, praying on a consistent basis, and various other changes in the last year of our lives. Um, we got married, we're blessed with our first house, we're expecting a baby girl. Professionally, I've had the best year of my career as God, God has enabled us to give in so many ways and to prepare, uh, prepare for becoming a family, as Jesus and the Holy Spirit made me a new person. I've also been able to impact people around me, including bringing several people to the Lord this year. My life is completely different, and I want to thank you for setting me down the path. I know 2020 wasn't the best year for many people, but for my wife and me, I have, I've been blessed beyond belief. And uh, that's a great testimony. And that's why um, I always give that challenge out to give God one year of your life and you won't regret it. I got bunches and bunches of, of uh, testimony sent to me like that. And this is the reason why we strategically place at the beginning of the year 21 days of prayer and fasting, which by the way, starts today. Uh, we're gonna start off for 21 days of just seeking God. We're gonna do a lot of prayer and, and a little bit of fasting. And um, I wanna invite you to join us. Um, prayer is Monday through Friday, 7 to 7 45. 5 a.m. Now, the thing about it is this. Love to have you come in person, but if you can't come in person, we're going to stream all of the prayer services live only, and so if you're at home with the kids cooking eggs, just join us in cooking eggs and praying, and uh, you know, whatever, wherever you are, but I'd love to have you in person. I think it's best if you can make it in person for 21 days, and what we're saying is, God, we're going to give you the first part of our day and the first part of our year. There's just something about it when you do that. The return on that is incredible, and in fact, um, our team has these books called Pray First Books. I didn't write this. Someone else did, but there's a lot of great information on praying, and we're they're free for you out there. Stop out in the lobby at the table out there. Grab one of these. It'll be a great guide. If, you've, if you struggle with consistency in your prayer life, this is going to be a great guide for you to, to use this year. Now, at the same time, we're going to do prayer and fasting Saturday morning from 9 to 10 a.m. What I'll promise you is this. If you give God the first part of your day and the first part of your year, you won't regret it at the end of the year. Second thing is, is we're going to have fasting. Prayer, prayers, prayer connects us to God. Fasting disconnects us from the world. And here's the, here's the thought that whatever you starve dies and whatever you feed thrives. So if you feed your relationship with God, it'll thrive. If you starve, how I many it'll be good to starve our flesh you know, for a little bit, you know? And fasting is just giving up something, you know? Like for me, I'm fasting broccoli and Brussels sprouts. So that's, that's my fast. No, I'm not just kidding. But, but uh, I, you know, whatever you're fasting, you know, make a decision ahead of time. And, you know, and it's best for us and our family is we kind of sit around and like last night we did this. We all got together in the living room last night and, and talked about which other is going to fast. And we can hold each other accountable. Now, what fasting does, it disconnects you from the world. And it would be a great season to just disconnect after the holidays and all of that, you know, when we've kind of indulged a little bit and got a little, ate a little bit more, slept in a little bit more, and probably spent more than we should. It'd be a great time to sort of disconnect from that for a season. Now, the Bible talks about different kinds of fast. They're in the Bible. You don't have to do the same fast that I'm doing. There's a complete fast. The Bible talks about that. It's where you just give up food for a certain portion of time. And I don't recommend that for anybody uh, unless God's leading you that way. And, and of course, I would recommend you check with your doctor if you're taking medication. That's just when you sort of just give up food and just drink juices or liquids, that sort of thing. And, and that's in there. And there's also what they call partial fast. And that's like, uh, we, call, we get the Daniel fast from that. And that's where you just give up s certain foods for a certain portion of time. And like you can give up sugar. Like one of my kids is giving up sugar. Another one's giving up soda. You know, that sort of thing. And, and, uh, and just for three 
three weeks, you do that, and, and, and it's not about just, I tell you what fasting is not. Fasting is not proving to God that you love him. Fasting is not penance. You're not suffering. You're paying a price. Jesus took all your suffering on the cross. Fasting is just disconnecting from the world. It's saying, hey, not my flesh isn't in control. I'm in control. And then, and then there's also, um, you know, you can do uh, uh, portions of a day. Like you can skip a meal and, uh, or just eat dinner time or breakfast, whatever, or skip a lunch meal. And the idea is not just to give up food. The idea is to replace that time with seeking God. And I'll throw this fast, and this isn't a biblical fast, but I think it speaks to the culture that we're in now, and that's a soul fast. I think um, where we get rid of uh, some of the media in our life, and uh, I mean, it might do you good to get rid of 21, di- for 21 days of social media, you know, it might help you out, you know, some of the news, and you, you might find out you're a lot happier without that. It might be a permanent fast for you, you know, you know but d- do that, and, and I know, like, like, that's not a big issue for me personally, like, I like food more than social, I promise you that, uh, I like food more than chatting with you on Twitter. I can promise you that, but, um, but it, it, I think it'll help us out a little bit. And so we're going to do that for 21 days. Here's the idea. We're setting us, ourselves up for the best year of our life. And this kind of leads us into our series. And this series is just called Face to Face. And let me kind of set up what, what I want to do in this series. I, I, think, I think we all know this, that our nation is in trouble. I think we all know that our nation needs a move of God. I think we all know that really our schools, our young people, I think, I call it revival. Uh, and I don't even mean, when I talk about revival, I don't mean just lo- long church services and every night gathering. I don't mean that at all. I'm talking about where people have a sense that there, something's missing in their life and they know God is the answer. How many know our nation needs, really needs a move of God right now? And... Um, and I want to set this up for you. Here's a thesis for this. Is I believe, I talked about this on Christmas Eve, but I believe that God is a God to be experienced. That God is a God not just to be studied about. God is a God not just to learn about. But God is a God that he wants to enter into a, a powerful relationship with you. God is, cannot be encapsulated into a message or into a sermon. And for young people, we, you don't want God to be the God of your mom and dad. You know, for a lot of us, God is the God, and, and adults here, God, we believe in God and we love God and we're devoted to God, but God is the God of Moses. He's the God of Noah. He's the God of Abraham. He's the God that interacted with men thousands of years ago, but he's not really interested in doing that today. And God, God wants to move in our life, but can I tell you something? We have a role to play in this. We, we have a part to, to play in this. And for, and for some this series is going to impact in a great way because God is distant. You know, like you love God and you believe in God and you serve God, but he's, he's just distant. Or you might even say, well, I believe God interacts with Norm. And I think that's even almost like a slap in the face that you would think that God would interact with me, but not you. And this isn't new for our, in the Bible days. There's a story in the Old Testament of a man named Gideon. And let me set this up for you. Gideon was, they, they were God's chosen people, Israel, and Israel kind of turned their back on God. And, and when they would do this, God would lift his hand of protection off of them, and they'd get attacked from all the surrounding nations around them, where they're in that season of their life right then. And in Judges chapter 6 and verse 13, the, his angel appeared to Gideon. He said, but sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, then why is all this going on? Like, why is all this happening? I think like that's a legitimate thought that we have. Like, if God is really a God that wants us to experience him, then why is all this happening? And by the way, where are all his wonders that our, that our fathers told us about? Where are all the miracles that we've heard about? Like, where is God in our culture today? And they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But here's where a lot of us are. But now. Like, we believe all that happened. We believe that God did move. We believe that God did want to interact with people. But what about now, especially 2020? Like, where were you, God, in 2020? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us in the hands of Midian. And I think that's where a lot of us are experiencing today. We're like, well, God, where are you? Now, the New Testament speaks to this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16, and this will be the text sort of for this series. He said, whenever though they turn to face God. And that's my hope in this series. I'll just be honest with you. That's my hope that somewhere along the way we would turn and face God. 
Now, there would be a moment in these next three or four weeks that we, I'd share about this that you would say, I'm going to turn to God, and I'm going to face God. I'm not going to learn about him. I'm going to know him, as Moses did. And then something happens. God removes the veil. Like, that's the barrier. Whatever is between you and God, like, God will remove that out of your life. I don't know what it is. It'd be different things for different people. But if we turn, if I could just turn and face God, and then God will remove the barrier between him and me, and there they are. Here's the series title. There we are face to face. If we could be, what if we could be face to face with God? They suddenly recognized that God is a living, personal presence, not a piece of chiseled stone. And here it is. And by the way, because here's, here's sort of the bait for you. When God is personally present, like when you have a relationship with God like this, not a God that, 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 that you learn about, not a God you hear about, but a God you have a relationship with, a living spirit, here's what happens. That old constricting legisla- legislation is recognized as obsolete. We're free of it, all of us. Here's what he's saying. It's not a God of just rules and regulations. It's not a God I have to. I, in other words, I, here, I'll say it to you like this. I don't have to read my Bible. I get to read my Bible. I don't have to go to church. I want to go to church. I don't have to serve. I, want, I don't have to pray. I want to pray. He said something will happen if you can switch from knowing about God to knowing God, to having a face-to-face relationship with him. He said we're free of it, all of us. Nothing between us and God. Our faces shining with the brightness of his face. And so, here it is. We are transfigured much like the Messiah. Our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like him. He said, here's the trade-off. If you could do this, if you could have this face-to-face encounter with him, you could have this experience with him, man, he's gonna remove some barriers. You can get rid of all those sort of old religious mindsets, but here's what we're looking for. Slowly, not in an instant maybe, but all throughout the year, January, February, March, summer, fall, then December, you're going to write in the letter and say, my life was gradually changed this year. I became more like him. Now, when I kind of put this together, I knew like here, I knew I would be here and I knew that you, you, you ever, have you ever, have you ever had an experience in your life where you go to someone and you say, man, this was the most incredible experience I've ever had. This was the best meal I've ever had or this was the best vacation I ever had. I was in Rome and I, I saw the Vatican or, or, I, or I, uh, you know, I, I had this re- meal at a restaurant. It was so good. And people are looking at you going, mm-hmm, yeah. And are you telling them a story that's so, really funny and no one's laughing? And you, and you get to the place where you go like, well, you had to be there. Yeah. And, and you, you, you ever had that where you go, well, you just, you just had to have been there then you, you would understand if you were there. And I, here's what I knew. You're looking at me like I'm telling my kids a story. They're like, I don't, dad, it's not funny. You know, that's just not good. And, like, and I always say, well, guys, you, if you were there, you'd think it was funny. I knew I'd come to a point in this message. I really did. Where I'd have to almost, I, I know you're not, I'm not able to articulate what I'm trying to communicate to you this morning. That if you could get face to face with God, if you could go a little bit further with God, if you would just not know about God, but know God this year, then your life would really be transformed and be changed. And I know you're like, well, I don't know, you know, I, I, I know you're not getting it. I know um, two years ago, my wife and we celebrated our 25th anniversary. And um, so I, it was the beginning of the year, I said, honey, what do you want to do for our 25th anniversary? Now, those that know us know that when Dean and I first got married, we lived overseas in Europe, and so we lived in France, right outside of Paris, and so we've been all through Italy and, and Switzerland and Germany and, and France, lived over there, so, so th- I was glad I was off the hook for that, because she didn't want to go to Europe, and I said, where, where else would you want to go? We're around the beaches here, so she didn't care about Hawaii or the Caribbean. She said, you know what I really want to do, Norm? I really just want to go to out west, just you and me by ourselves for a week, and I just want to explore the west. I want to go to the Grand Canyon. I want to go to Sedona. I want to do some hiking. I want to take our time. And I just want to go slow. I said, count me in, babe. That's cheaper than Europe. And so, um, you know what I'm saying? And so, so we went there and we had, we had this incredible time. And so when we came back, the kids were like, how was, how was your trip? I'm like, oh my gosh, it was absolutely incredible. It was amazing. I mean, when you go to the Grand Canyon, if you've ever been there, I, you, you can only really be there for about a half an hour, but it's just, I mean, it just takes your breath away. 
It's just absolutely incredible. And you go to, I said, my favorite part was Sedona. They go, what's so incredible about Sedona? I said, man, the red rocks and the hiking. And they're like, really? Okay, I'll, this was three minutes in our conversation. Have a good day, dad. Back to their thing. And so, so I, said, I showed them a picture. I said, hey guys, here's, here's a picture. This was taken from our table on our 25th anniversary. This was the night we celebrated it. And this is where we were eating at. And that was the view we had. And, and at that moment, they said, man, that, that really is pretty incredible. And they're thinking about the view. I was thinking about the steak I was eating. It was pretty incredible. <laughs> you know, and uh, so here we are having our 25th anniversary dinner, looking at this incredible view and, and enjoying it. And at that moment, when I was able to, sh- I tried to communicate to them what the Red Rocks were like and what it was like to be there with that climate and eating outside. And when they saw that, all of a sudden they started grasping it. What I'm gonna try to do in this series is I'm gonna try to show you what it would be like if you had an encounter with God. What it would be like if you moved your relationship into not just knowing about God, but knowing God. We're calling it face to face because you have a part to play in this. Here's what the scripture says. He said, if you would move your heart closer to God, he will even come closer to you. A lot of us are waiting for God to move. And can I just, like I just say this really respectfully, God already made his move. It's up to you to make your move. If you want to get closer to God, like he's there. He said, if you, if you even come close to me, I'll, I'll go a little bit further. I'll come closer to you. So could this be the year where you make your move to God and God makes his move to you. And the thing is, why do, why do we need face-to-face encounters? Why, do we, why isn't it good enough just to know about God? Why isn't it good enough just to learn about God? Here, and I, here's some reasons why. I think, um, if you're a note taker, here's some thoughts why we need face-to-face encounters is because we need an encounter, not just an explanation. And the church has settled for that. We've settled for just learning about God. In fact, I'm gonna give you some dates and, um, and you can write these down. These, if you're a parent, you'd wanna write these dates down. Our East Coast Kids Camp is coming up June 21st to the 23rd. And uh, I'd wanna, if I had kids in elementary class, I'd wanna schedule my, ca- my vacation around them. Our East Coast Youth Conference is coming up July 12th through the 15th. Hillsong's coming back again for that. Uh, it's gonna be right here at East Coast. And, and the reason why I wanted you to get those dates is you can plan your calendar around them. Here's why. Because when we, when we plan out our children's and youth conferences, we're going to have one goal in mind. We want them to have fun and all that. We want them to make, have friendships. But we, it's really not about the speakers. It's really not about the sermons. It's really not, honestly, it's really not about the messages. messages. We want the kids to encounter God. We, we try to create environments where they experience God. We try to create environments where they don't just hear about God, but they get to know God a little bit. Because here's what I want. I don't want them to leave East Coast when they get out of high school. That God is the God of their mom and dad, but not my God. And let me tell you where all this came from. Many years ago, our kids, uh, before we were in this building, before we did our own conferences, we would send our kids to a youth camp. And um, we send, and they would go, busloads would go over there to the youth camp. And, and this camp, and it was just a, one of those camps that great messages, great, uh, a lot of fun, great food and all that. But they would have these services where kids would just encounter God. They would experience God. And that was the whole, that was the whole gist of the conference is that you would get to know God a little bit better. And so that happened probably, this is about eight, nine years ago. Well, fast forward two years after that happened, uh, kids were there, one of our youth I come to me, he said, hey, pastor, I need to meet with you. And he, he graduated high school, went to college, and he said, um, and I had, I had a relationship with him. He, so I said, what do you want to meet about? Came to my office. He said, I'm denouncing God. Uh, I don't believe that God exists anymore. I went to college, and one of my fine professors uh, talked me out of serving God, said serving God is all made up of man's, man's mind. It's a crutch. You're a weak person if you need Jesus, so I'm not weak, and I don't need Jesus. I was, Thank you, professor. And, um, and so we got to talking, and man, it got pretty, kind of a little bit heated, honestly, him and me, because I had known him. I said, hey, listen, stop. Let's go have some lunch. We left my office, and we went to lunch. And he carried with him, I mean, just notebooks of stuff that the professor had given him to lay out to me about why God doesn't exist, why Jesus and all this sort of stuff is for weak people. 
And so we sat down at this restaurant. I said, young man, I said, before we get started, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hear you out. I see you got notebooks. And I'm gonna give you the whole afternoon just to try to convince me that God doesn't exist. I'm all ears, but I need you to answer one question first. He said, what's that? I said, remember two years ago when you went to youth camp? He goes, yeah. I said, remember when you came back and you got off the bus, I was there? He goes, yeah. I said, remember what you told me? He goes, no. I said, I'll remind you. You got off that bus and you told me, he goes, I remember. You told me God is real. I said, well, how do you know God's real? He goes, because I went up there and they prayed for me. And I thought it was a big, big bunch of fake stuff up there. And he goes, I, I just fell out. I don't know. And no one touched me. I fell out. He goes, but pastor, I couldn't get off the ground. I sat there for an hour and God was talking to me. God was speaking to me. I said, okay, young man, I need to ask you a question. And then you can talk to me. Which one was real? The experience you had then or what you're experiencing now? Because they, they both don't exist together. He closed his books and said, you got me there. Because here's what I tell you. We, 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 don't, we need encounters, not just messages. Messages are good, and I like all that, but we need encounters. That's what we're going to have with our kids. In Acts chapter 4, in verse 13, I'll set this up for you. Peter and John, they were going to the temple to pray, and there's a crippled man there, and he begged them for some money, and they didn't have any money, and, but they did pray for him, and he got healed, and this crippled man stood up and started walking and leaping in the temple. He's praising God. Well, the leaders of the church didn't like it, and the council members were astonished as they witnessed the bold courage of Peter and John, especially, here's what astonished them, when they discovered that they were just ordinary men who had never had any religious training. Like these haven't been through seminary, haven't gone to Bible school, none of that. There's normal, ordinary men. Then they began to understand the effect that Jesus had on them simply, here it is, by encountering him simply by spending time with him. In fact, Pete, Paul, Peter said it like this rather. He said, it's impossible for us to stop speaking about all the things which we have seen and heard. You want to know what wins the argument every time? You want to settle the argument? A changed life settles the argument. The Bible warns us about getting into all this needless fighting and arguing about scripture and theology and all that. He says, the Bible says, don't, don't get caught up in all that. My way's right, your way's wrong. Do you know what stops, this, stops an argument every time? My life has been changed. I love that because because the same situations in John chapter nine, a blind man got healed. Jesus healed a blind man. They were pretty upset about it, the leaders. In John chapter nine and verse 17, they turned, the leaders turned to the blind man and they said, hey, um, what, what do you have to say about him talking about Jesus? And, and he replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know this, I was blind, but now I see. He said, hey, I don't know what you guys think about him, what's right or what's wrong, but all I know is my life was changed when I had an encounter with him. Just, and, and, I, and I know that, like, like, like getting out in the community, I've even talked to people. I was a, we were at a restaurant once, you know, I, uh, right up the road here in Tuscaloosa and Redbug, and we're sitting down eating lunch, and, and someone said something, so what do you do? And I always say, well, I'm a, I'm a staff pastor at a church. They go, oh, what church? East Coast. And they go, oh, I heard about that church. That's that, you guys, are like, that's where they raise their hands and all that sort of thing. And I says, yeah, we bring out snakes on the first Sunday only, though. And, um, <laughs> you know, just kidding, but, but they, you know, they said, they heard, and I, I get that we had that reputation around town, but can I tell you what, when, when it all is over and done with, whether we raise hands or don't raise hands, what, what, what will never, never stop happening is lives being changed. So I go to that church, yeah, that's the church I went to, I went there, I didn't love, know God or even love God, but now my life has radically changed and turned around. That's, that's what I'm talking about. We don't need just explanations, we need experiences. Here's another thought. Why do we need encounters? Because we need, we need power. We need miracles. We serve a God of miracles. We serve a God who can and does want to work miracles. I was the dean of a Bible college um, uh, for a lot of years in, in Oklahoma, and uh, we sent out thousands of students. And um, these two students, um, young, young men, when they, and I, I still know them, they, back then they weren't married, this is probably, a, this guy had to be 15, 
20 years ago now. And um, just two eight, 19, 20 year old men, young men that graduated, and they were gonna, they said, I said, what are you gonna do? They said, we saved up some money, we were gonna buy, we buy some airline tickets, we're gonna go to Asia. I said, where are you gonna preach at when you get there? They said, we don't know. I said, would well, you have anybody that wants you to come? They go, no. I said, what are you gonna do then? We're just gonna show up and see what God does. I thought, well, that, I said, you can't do that. And they go, we're gonna do it. And so they got there, they bought airline tickets, they got there, had no money, and two young guys, they're over in Asia, and they found their way to a village. And when they got to this village, they shared Jesus with this village. Now, this village really hadn't seen many, many uh, Western people. And in fact, when they introduced Jesus to them, they didn't even know Jesus. They never heard of Jesus. And when, when these young students explained to them who Jesus was, they said, yes, we will put our faith in Jesus. The whole village. And they were so fired up and they were so excited about their having revival in this village in Asia until they said, we will serve Jesus along with our other thousands of gods. And then our, these two young students called, man, we didn't know what to do. Because that wasn't the concept like, add Jesus to your list. Like Jesus isn't a God, he's the God, right? And so they were trying to get through this. And so they were in this moment where they were really bold. You ever said some things you're like, man, it's like the words come out of your mouth, you want to get them back? And they said, well, I'll tell you what you're going to do. We're going to find out whether these gods are alive or Jesus is alive. Tonight, bring all the sick from this small village, bring them to the center of the village, and we're going to pray for them and Jesus will heal them. They said, as soon as they said it, they were like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. They're out in this village in the middle of Asia. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, and, and so they went back to their tent area. And one of them said to the other, what, why did you say that? <laughs> and so they were literally talking this way. They were like, well, if we get out there, you know, and this tells you how much faith they had. And when we get out there, if nothing happens, we're going to head out this way. <laughs> so they brought the sick. Now, listen, if you've been to any third world countries, and, you know, they don't treat, especially in villages, they don't have access to, to good medical care if they could even afford it, if they even had it. And so they brought people with tumors and crippled and people that were really sick and lame. And they got these two young 18, 19-year-old students started praying for them in Jesus' name. And they said all of a sudden tumors started disappearing. A, a, a bent leg started straightening out. And these, all of a sudden, these people all of a sudden started getting healed. The power of God started manifesting and miracles started happening. And those people denounced all their other gods who were dead in any ways, who weren't alive, and they put their faith in Jesus. <laughs> Listen, we need power. That's why we need encounters. Acts chapter eight says this, the crowds listened intently to Philip. Now, in our modern day church, the crowds listened intently because they're good communicators, because they can package it well. But this wasn't the way it was in the early church. They listened, they were eager to hear his message. Why? To see the miraculous signs he did. So there was great joy in that city. We, we could have great joy. Think about that. If we could introduce the God of miracles and power to people's life, what it could produce for them. Here's a third thought. And this, this third point, I don't like the way it's written, but it's the best way I can describe it. And that is this, we need presence more than anything. What I wanted to put down is this, we need presence more than routine. But routine isn't bad in and of itself. Routine is bad if you're just going through the motions. If you're just going through the motions without thinking about it. Like here's, we, at your East Coast, if you've been to church here for any length of time, you know what we do. You're going to come in, we're going to sing three songs, maybe four if the songs are short. Then someone's going to get up and sort of lead you through a transition moment. We're going to praise God a little bit. You're going to see some announcements. And then I'm going to come back up and I'm going to kind of share a message about 35 minutes. And some of you are so smart, you can fill out the end of my message before I even get to the bottom of it. You, you know where I'm going with it. Then I'm going to give an altar call and we're, you're going to leave. And there's nothing wrong with that. It works. Only thing is wrong with that is if you're just going through the motions without your heart in it. If you're, just reading, if you're just reading your Bible today without putting your heart into it, when you start, you got it all figured out, but when you start going through the motions, motions without your heart in it, something starts to die. I wonder how many of us are going through the motions of Christianity without our heart in it anymore. And that, that goes through any 
for any relationship. If you're married, if you just go through the motions of being married and being absent on the inside, something starts to die. And I, honestly, I'll be honest with you, I'm a routine guy. Um, that's just sort of my makeup, my personality. Um, my wife doesn't like this about me, but it's the reality. I wake up at the same time every day. I've eaten the same breakfast almost every day for 25 years. And um, I've had the same hairdo, a little bit less hair, that I had when Dean and I first got married. And, and I, I, just, I'm, I read my Bible the same way every day. I pray the same way. I have my, I have my location. My, my, my weeks are pretty much, my days are pretty much mapped out. On, on these days, I'll do meetings. On these days, I'm going to write and pray. On these days, I'm going to um, gather with staff. On these days, I'll do meet counseling appointments. It's just sort of how my life, I just, it works better that way. In my marriage, I can be very engaged, but sometimes I can be too routine in it. Can I tell you something? If you're routine in anything without having your heart in it, whatever your routine at starts to die. Even church, even God. We can have a routine because it works good, but if we're just going through the motions, then even this starts to die. This is why it's really important for Dean and I, being married as long as we have now, to take trips by ourselves because our life is pretty, pretty somewhat busy and um, a, lot of, a lot of places we're going and coming and going and, and they don't have a lot of free time and, and, and honestly, is sometimes even our marriage can get that way and so that's why sometimes we just like, we'll just gather up, like even this last week, I said to Dean, I, Dean and I said, we're gonna get out of town. So they said to the kids, hey, we're gonna get out of town. They go, good, where are we going? I said, we ain't going anywhere. I'm going somewhere, you staying home. They go, what? That's not fair. I says, hey, life's not fair. Get used to it. And uh, they said, well, where are you going? I said, we're going to the beach by yourselves. Why do you have to go to the beach by yourselves? Because of you. <laughs> That's why we have to go by ourselves. What are you going to do when you get there? We're going to eat and kiss all day long. That's all we're going to do. All day. What? Why? Because routine isn't bad. Routine in and of itself isn't bad, but what you need is you can't be absent in the routine. Here's what I'll tell you. Church, the way we do church, isn't wrong, it isn't bad, but we need presence more than anything else, everybody. We need God to be here. The scriptures talks about this in Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. It says, it stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead, what if this alive and present God could move into your life. What, 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 if, what if God could not just be a God you see on Sundays, what if he could move into your life? Here's what he'll do. He'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bringing you alive to himself. Well, see, when, because when God lives and breathes in you, and he does, you are delivered from that dead life. With his spirit living in you, your body will be as, as alive as Christ. What am I saying to you? Is if you pursue God, he will resurrect what is dead or dying in your life. Like, I don't know what is dead in your life. I don't know what's dying in your life. It could be a marriage, it could be your finances, it could be a physical thing. I don't know what it is, but if you would get God to move in, he would resurrect it. If this would be a year, we say, God, I'm not just going to learn about you, I'm going to get to know you some this year. And that's what this series is all about, face-to-face -face encounters. And you can go all through the scripture, and you can see some, you'll see people who had these face-to-face -face encounters with Jesus, and their life was changed. Remember the woman with the issue of blood? She was sick for 12 years. She finally, one day, she said, if I, could, if I could just touch him, I'll be changed. And she was changed. Blind Bartimaeus, they said, blind Bartimaeus, don't bother Jesus, be quiet, you're embarrassing us. The Bible says he cried even louder. He said, I, I have, I, I can't, what you're offering doesn't work. What you're giving me isn't working. I need something that works. And can I tell you something, everybody? Going to church doesn't work without the presence of God. Like, this is good, I love all the small groups and grow, all that's good, but we need God, everybody. Amen? Because we, whatever is dead in your life, he wants to resurrect. And so the question comes is, how? How do I have this norm? Because I want this. I remember, I was young, I got saved, I'd go to churches like ours, and man, they'd preach a message, and they would stop right here. 
And I'd be all fired up. Yes, I want more God. I want more of his presence in my life. And an hour later, I'd leave church and go, how? Like, I want it, but how? Like, I, I, I think everybody does want this. But the question is how? And that's where I want to end it today. If you give me three minutes, I'll end it right this. How? How do I get more of God in my life this year? There's a reason why we're doing 21 days of prayer and fasting in January. There's a reason why tomorrow morning at 7 a.m., I'm going to be here. Can I tell you this? I know some of our staff over the years have come to me and say, well, you pastor, I'm just not a morning person. I like to pray in the morning, but I'm just not a morning person. Can I tell you something? I'm not a morning person either. Can I tell you this? I hate getting out of bed. I've been fasting for three hours and I'm already hungry. And I balked up last night, you know what I'm saying? I prepared for this moment. I went back into my, in between services in my room and there's nothing to eat back there. And, and, and can I tell you, I like food. I hate getting out of the bed in the morning, but can I also tell you this? I'm desperate for God. I know, see you might be okay, but I'm not okay without God. Because I know how bad I really am. I know my faults, I know my weaknesses. I, need, I desperately need God in my life this year. So here we'll wrap it up with Gideon, where we started. We're going back to the same verse. But Sir Gideon replied, if God is with us, why is all this happening to us? Where, where's all the wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But Lord, Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? How? That's the question, how? I think that's where we all are. How? How do I get this? Because I'll tell you the truth. He said, my clan's the weakest in Manasseh. And by the way, they're the weakest, and I'm the least in my family. And the Lord answered, so here's what I'm going to do. I will be with you. So what's the one, th- one thing I could tell you to have these face-to-face encounters with God? Here's, here's what I thought. If we could just take one step further than your normal this year, what's the one thing that you could do that would produce the greatest results in your life? Like I, the teacher in me wants to break this down and give you all what I see, but I'm going to resist that because your one thing might be different than my one thing. What's the one thing, one step that you could take this year? Could it be that you start a Bible reading plan this year? Could it be that you engage in 21 days of prayer and fasting? Could it be that you have a prayer life this year? Could it be like maybe worship? Maybe, maybe worship's your deal. Like, like um, when it comes time to worship, you, you want to worship, but, but you don't. You know, it's kind of like you, 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 you feel that, that worship in your toe and your movement. No one can see it. And you, well, God sees it. And he does. But then you don't come, to, you're, not, you're not part of a church like this. Like, like you don't, I, I get it. I remember my first time in a church like this. I thought you people were crazy. People raising their hands and all this sort of thing. And so, but maybe this is the year we say, hey, I, for worship for, for five years, I've just been sitting there stone cold. But this year I'm gonna go, I'm gonna take one step. I'm gonna actually lift my hands and worship Jesus. What if this is the year we're like, you said, okay, I'm gonna be generous. What if this was the year that I'm gonna take that one step with God and say, I'm gonna commit. I'm gonna go all in for God for 12 months. Not for the rest of my life, just for 12 months. And I'm just asking you, measure it. Because here's what, I promise you, this is what'll happen. Isaiah 49, this is a verse that God spoke to me personally last year. At the end of last year, about October, I was really, was really struggling um, just ministry-wise, not personally, just ministry-wise, I was just so much need. And, and uh, honestly, if I just tell you the truth is, no matter what we were doing, we'd sit in meetings and we would do something and 50% of the people would be happy about it, the other half would be upset with us. And I mean, phone call after phone call. And I mean, I just was struggling. Like, like, I'm not saying I was like thinking about quitting or anything. I was just like, you know, just like, you know, God, man, you know, this is harder. God, where are you? Like, this is a pandemic. We need you right now. And God gave me this verse. And he says, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. 
Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. God's like, hey, don't worry. But those who, and this is what God spoke to me, quit working so much and start seeking me more. And it was for me. I'm not saying that's for you. But I'm working long, long hours and going home and putting the kids to bed and going to my office and trying to figure this thing out for the next day. He said, hey, stop all that. Hope in the Lord. He'll renew your strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. And they will walk and not faint. You ever know about an eagle? One thing about an eagle, if you ever see them, you don't ever see them flapping. What do they look for, those eagles? You'll see them soaring through the air, wings stretched out. They're looking for thermal drafts. And they'll catch a thermal draft and it'll carry them all the way up. And they'll soar through the skies. Then you see these little itty bitty little tiny, I call them wiener birds, flappy birds. And they just flap, 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 flap. They're not going anywhere. Flap, 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 flap. And then way above them is this eagle that catches these thermal drafts. And that's the picture that God's trying to paint. Someone who does it in their own strength, you're like that flappy bird in that game. Just flap, 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 flap. Or you can be like an eagle that says, okay, I'm not going to do it in my own strength. I'm going to go in God's strength this year. And I'm going to soar in the midst of a pandemic. And no matter what 2021 brings, God's going to renew my strength. Amen, everybody. Amen. 